Uh, before I get into the sermon, I just wanted us to watch wanted us to watch this video. I know a lot of us have already watched it before, but I wanted us just to be reminded of what is about to be passed in New South Wales. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or DE. The DE is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted spectrum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminary. Laminary is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. The baby's this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a soaker clamp. A soaker clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with the curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino. And in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the pre-born. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, that it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. <clears throat> that is what is being voted on in New South Wales to do abortions after 22 weeks. And I must admit, like when I first watched that video a couple of years ago, I was, I was really quite taken aback at that's what an abortion was. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know um, what entailed abortion. I was always against abortion. But watching that video, man, it just really brings it home. I can't believe that's what people actually support. I don't even know if people really know um, that's what they are supporting when they support a bill like this. Um, and you know what, I mean, 
I think like before I became a parent, before I be became a father, the, the topic of abortion never really, um, never really touched my heart because when, when you haven't had kids before, you, you don't really picture your own kid being there. I just, I just find it crazy that people who, who have children, <laughs> who are parents, can be pro-choice. Pro it just amazes me because, you know, before, when I wasn't a dad, I've never gone through a pregnancy, I've never gone through seeing my children, holding a newborn baby. It's not personal to you when you actually see that baby. I don't know um, why it is now when I hear about abortion stories and I hear about things like that. Like, it always brings me to tears and I just, I don't know why. I think it's because when I see things like that or I hear stories about, you know, people having a miscarriage or people losing a baby, you can't help but picture your own kid there. You know, you can't help but picture like, man, like these, this, that could be my child being ripped apart. You know, you see now a face to that. And I think, and that's why I think this unplanned movie is going to be actually quite powerful because if you didn't know, I'll tell you a bit about that unplanned movie. Uh, Abby Johnson, if you don't know the story, Abby Johnson was a uh, Planned Parenthood director. So she was like a head of one of the big Planned Parenthood abortion clinics and she oversaw like 22,000 abortions. And uh, one day she was actually helping out with an abortion procedure and she was the one holding the, the ultrasound thing so that the doctor could actually see because the normal, normal procedure is that they would just do it blind. Like that, that procedure that that doctor just explained, they would just do it blind, right? They knew a baby was in there, they'd just grab anything and start tearing it out. But some doctors believed it was safer for the woman to do it with an ultrasound. So Abby helped one of them and that's when she saw the baby inside actually responding to being touched, trying to get away from that and actually seeing a baby struggle for its life. So when you know, she went through a process of change, and um, eventually she became pro-life and that's what the story is about, her, her transformation from being pro-choice, a director of a Planned Parenthood clinic, to now being one of the big pro-life speakers and then they turned her, her story into a movie. Now what's interesting about the actor that plays her in that movie, I was just watching some interviews and things like that, she, the actor that actually plays that movie was almost aborted by her mother as well. She didn't know, cause when, and she didn't know when she took the part. She took the part and then she told her mom, because she knew her mom had had an abortion in the past. And then her mom shared with her, you know what, when she went to actually go get uh, Ashley, who's the actor that plays Abby Johnson, aborted, she was actually on the operating table. And then she felt sick to her stomach, she couldn't go through with it, and then she got off and she walked out. And I, I think when just hearing that story from Ashley, it was like, oh man, that is crazy that she found out she's playing this part and she found out she, that she was like seconds away from being aborted and now God is using her to play a part in one of probably one of the most important movies in regards to abortion. You know, it's like, a, you know, vaxxed in terms of vaccinations, like one of these key documentaries that was used. And uh, this, this movie sounds like it's going to be the same. I don't know when we can view it, but it sounds like a good idea for a movie night. Now, if you didn't know, like I said, I just wanted us to watch that video again. I know many of us have already watched it. But just internalize that this is, this is what they are voting on in New South Wales. This is what they were cheering for. But how wicked is the left side of politics that they have, they're trying to pass a bill that abortion's already somewhat legal up to 22 weeks and they want to pass a bill from 22 weeks up to birth as long as it has two signatures from a doctor and they cheer for that i mean do people really realize what they are voting for what they are supporting i mean most people i would dare say do not know whether that that's what what an abortion entails so i just want to give you a quick just a, just a general summary of if you haven't read through this bill, it's not actually that long. I posted it in the Facebook group. It's only 12 pages long. And if you didn't know, it was introduced by Alex uh, Greenwich. So he's the independent MP. So this is, we're talking about the state level now, not the federal level. He's the state MP, the local member 
for Sydney, the Sydney electorate or city. I don't know how they break them up. Now, if you didn't know, he was the same guy that was speaking on behalf of the same-sex marriage bill as well. So you remember that guy? I don't know if he's a homosexual. I think he might be because he, he talks a bit like one. So I think he might be, but he was also pushing for the same-sex marriage, the Yes campaign as well. So if you, if you remember his face, this is the same guy that is championing this you know, reproductive healthcare reform bill, which is basically decriminalizing abortion up to birth and, and setting some laws around that. Now, what are some of the key things that are in this law? So if you read through it, like I said, it's, very, it's quite short. It's 12 pages, but if you've ever read a law, you know, it's in dot points, so it's not just blocks and blocks of text. You can read through it quite quickly, just so you can get an idea of what it says. But a couple of key things it does is it, it'll also make abortion no longer a criminal act for the mother. So if you didn't know, New South Wales has a law, the Criminal Act, that was written in the 1900s, and that prohibited basically murder. Right? It also prohibited uh, abortion. But what happened just a couple of decades ago, like in the 1970s, there was a case law that basically undid that criminal law because what they allowed for is if, if the mother had any you know, economic, social, or... Um, what was the other one? Economic, social, or medical reasons to get an abortion before 22 weeks, then they could allow that. Now, I mean, that's so general. Like, you know, it's like I was telling Alex this morning. I mean, any, any, any reason to have an abortion could stress the woman out, have some mental you know, issue for her. So that's why even though abortion is technically illegal in New South Wales, the reason why it can be done is because of this case law. It basically nullifies the fact that anyone can be prosecuted as a criminal as long as you did it before 22 weeks. So what they're trying to do with this law is just remove the, de the criminalization of the act entirely. So it's another one of this type of slippery slope idea that, well, it's like, well, you're already allowing people to get divorced anyway, or you know, you're already allowing people to fornicate anyway. You know, what's the difference if it, we change what marriage is? So it's the same with this. I mean, you're already allowing people to abort their babies and murder their children under 22 weeks, so we're just decriminalizing it. It's already technically decriminalized. That's one of the arguments that is being made, that, that you know, women are already doing it. They shouldn't have this shame hanging over their head that they've broken a crime when technically they are allowed to do it because of case law. So that's one thing. The second thing is, like I said, it's allowing now what is illegal in New South Wales, which is to have abortion past 22 weeks. And the reason why this is so controversial to allow an abortion past 22 weeks is because 22 weeks, about 21, even Abby Johnson says at 20 weeks, there are some babies that have been delivered preterm and actually survived. So rather than, you know, rather than killing the baby, why not just deliver it? Just deliver it, let it live. But no, these people want to give people even after 22 weeks when the baby can live outside the womb without the mother, they still want to kill it. How wicked. Now, some things that have been removed that you might have heard in the media is, one is, it didn't have any provisions in there about whether you could abort, like what reasons you could abort for. So just like it says, just general, just you know, mental, elite, you know, social things or whatever. <laughs> For the, for the woman, but it didn't rule out any specific scenario. So if two doc, as long as two doctors signed, you could get an abortion after 22 weeks. Obviously, it's up to the discretion of the doctors. But I mean, it's, it's probably not hard to find a pro-abortion doctor, a pro-choice doctor that will sign, you know, because they, they agree that this is going to stress out the lady or whatever. But what they did, because so what happens in the lower house is they debate the bill, right? Because they, they, they introduce the bill and then they can debate and make amendments to the bill. They can make changes and updates. And that's where they, they may propose an amendment and then they can vote on whether that amendment goes into the bill or not. So some things that were taken out or added was one, you could not have an abortion purely based on sex selection. Meaning if you wanted a boy and you were with a girl, you couldn't just get an abortion because you didn't want a girl. Now, how they prove that, I'm not too sure, but if the sole purpose of the abortion is for sex selection, that is now prohibited. I, and I believe it's in the copy that I've got because as they amend it, they introduce a new copy. But you should be able to get the final copy now, now that it's been voted on and passed in the lower house because that's what the upper house has to review. 
The other thing that they had in there is that they were forcing doctors who would not uh, you know, help a woman with her abortion, they were forcing them that they had to refer that woman to another doctor that would help them. And they were saying, well, you can't, you can't force a doctor to go against his conscience if he doesn't want anything to do with an abortion. You can't make him then refer you on to somebody who's going to help you with an abortion. So they took that out as well and basically said some, a, a medical doctor can't be compelled to go against their uh, conscience. This is, this is what I understand. So don't hold me to all this. This is just what I've read and what I understand about, about what's going on. Now, you know one thing that was crazy? I don't know if you saw this on social media, but one thing they tried to introduce into the bill, that if you tried to abort a baby after 22 weeks, and it lived, right? It, it survived that procedure, that, that, that you had to give it medical treatment. You had to try and save it. They tried to introduce that into the bill, and you know what? It was voted out. It wasn't included. So now, even if a baby, they try and abort, they try and kill the baby, but the baby somehow survives that procedure, they're allowed to just let it die. That is insane. That is crazy. So, that's what this bill is. That is what the upper house is going to uh, debate on this week. We've got until Tuesday, 5 p.m., to put in a submission. And if they pass the law, then this will be the new law of the land in New South Wales. Because uh, criminal laws are generally dealt with at the state level, not at the federal level. And this is the title of my sermon. The title of my sermon is Abortion is Murder. Abortion is Murder. And that's, it's no less all abortion is murder. And we'll clarify what I mean by abortion and what I mean by murder as we go through the sermon, because we're going to go through objections that people have to the pro-life position. And you might already be familiar with these, but I just wanted to make sure you guys in church got this information, because you want to be solid in uh, how you defend the pro-life position. And know why, you know, when, when people come at you with all the exceptions, understand that these aren't exceptions. These are actually different cases. So abortion is murder, and, and you know, our church is unequivocally pro-life. You know, it's been on our website ever since I started this church that you know, if, you end, if you purposely end the life of a child in the womb, you are killing an innocent human being, and that is no less than murder. Now, this is why we read uh, Exodus 20, because we went through the Ten Commandments. But one point I just wanted to make was, you know, what is murder? Murder is not just killing another human being. Right? Murder is when you kill another innocent human being, and more specifically, when man kills another innocent human being. Exodus 20.13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, people sometimes take this and just say, well, all killing is wrong. No, no, not all killing is wrong. The tenth the, the Ten Commandments is specific to murder. We even see Jesus, when he quotes uh, the Ten Commandments in the New Testament, he says here, he saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Now, why do I say that not all killing is wrong? Well, you have certain instances where killing is the right thing to do, like in the instance of capital punishment, because the... The crime of murder ought to be punished by capital punishment, which is killing the person. But that's not murder. Why? Because that person is not innocent. Right? That person is guilty of a crime that warrants the death penalty. So when they are killed, they're not, they're not being murdered. Right? That's why when people say, oh, you're for murder when you're for capital punishment. No, because murder is killing the innocent, not killing the guilty who are worthy of, uh, of death. Leviticus 24, we'll just look at some Bible verses here. He that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Exodus 21, he that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. Now, if somebody takes the law into their own hands and goes and carries out this punishment, that is murder because they don't have the authority to take that person's life. But when the government executes punishment, that 
it is not murder. So I'm not saying we go out and take the law into our own hands. What I'm saying is the government, if it was a righteous government, would have laws executing and ensuring that those who are found guilty of murder are put to death. Look at what it says here. He that stealeth a man and selleth him, for if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Now I know this is not what people necessarily do when they commit an abortion you know, kidnapping and selling because, you know, and things like that. Man, but I just, I just thought of the whole issue around abortion when I see, you know, that selling people, it just made me think of, you know, when they're selling the body parts. You know, they, you know, they, they make the abortion and they sell the parts off for money. Uh, it's just what made me think of when I, when I read this verse. Look at here in Numbers 35. Doesn't this remind you of the video we just watched? And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. So people that commit abortions, people that have had an abortion, the reality of it is they have committed a murder. Now am I saying that you know, people that have committed abortion, had abortions in the past, shouldn't you know, seek forgiveness, seek healing, confess it to God and move on? No, of course not. You know, we've all done wrong things in the past, some more heinous than others. So it's not about just dragging people who have made mistakes in the past to not be able to move forward. But one way you're going to move forward if somebody's had an abortion is they admit the wrong that they've done and, and, and not you know, be complacent and complicit in future generations making the same mistake because you can't Deal with your own guilt and your own shame. You just need to confess it to God, confess it as a sin, and then join the pro-life movement and fight for those that have not yet been killed. But that is what it is. It is what it is. If you kill a baby in the womb, it is murder. Now why you've got capital punishment, that's, that's one exception to, to killing. You've also got issues of war as well. So I don't have any examples that I've got, I'm bringing up, but also when, you know, when nations may defend themselves in war or God would send a nation into war. And you say, well, why, why is God able to kill, but man's not able to kill? Well, it's because God is the one that gives life, so he's the one that's able to take it. He has the authority to give life. He has the authority to take life. So God can send a nation in to judge another nation. And don't think that it's just Israel that he used to judge another nation, because who did he use to judge the nation of Israel? He used another nation, right? The Babylonians, the Assyrians. So God did use nations to judge other nations, and that's not murder because he has the right to take life because he's the one that gave it. It's the, it belongs to him. Deuteronomy 32, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand so just note that you know that not all killing is murder so just just be aware if you're making statements like oh killing is wrong you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because not all killing is wrong there is a time to 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 kill even in uh in ecclesiastes i believe that is one of those things and that time is when you may be defending yourself in war or you know, self-defense as well is another reason why you can kill as well. The Bible even has laws that if somebody breaks into your house and it's in night, if you kill that person, you haven't committed murder. But if, it, if you can see who it is, if it's day, then it is murder. You should try and restrain that person. But if you are in self-defense, that's not murder. Um, and the other one is, uh, obviously, capital punishment. Now let's go through four objections. You may be familiar with these, but I just wanted to cover them just so I, I would teach the church this morning on these objections. We're going to go through four, and uh, hopefully you see how these are not really valid objections to uh, the objection to abortion. Number one is, no one knows when life begins. No one knows when life begins. So they say, well, because no one knows where life begins, well, then you may not be ending a life. Now, if that's the case, that would actually be very irresponsible. If you think about it, if you don't know when life begins, if you don't know whether something is alive or not, I mean, is it more responsible to say, well, therefore, okay, it's okay to kill? Or is it more responsible to say, well, maybe we shouldn't kill it just in case it is alive? 
No. So if we don't know when life begins, and science doesn't, in what arbitrary age, if it's not conception, what arbitrary age does life begin? You know, when pe different people will take breaths at different points of age, they develop at different stages. I mean, what arbitrary time along the development of the baby are you going to say now it's alive if it's not uh, conception? Because it can't be birth. Why? Because birth is an arbitrary date as well. People get born at different times. People, um, you know, even like preterm delivery and whatnot. So even science confirms that life begins at conception. But if we don't know, how is that responsible to say it's all right to kill? I mean, let's say somebody was, was in a coma or something and you didn't know whether they were going to live or not. I mean, would it be responsible to, to, to just kill them just because they're in a coma? It's the same thing. <clears throat> I'm sure you can think of better analogies, but I think the analogy that was in the, the, the live action uh, video was if you're a hunter out and you see a rustle in the bushes and you don't know whether that's your mate or whether that's an animal, would you shoot? No, because if you, there's a possibility that that's a human life, you're not going to shoot. And it's the same if you don't know when life begins. Now, the Bible is very clear when life begins. Life begins at conception. Isaiah 7, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Look how it's quoted in Matthew 1. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. So you see, to conceive is at the point where you are already with child. If you are conceived and you are carrying a baby, you have a child within you, not just a clump of cells, not just a blastocyst or whatever they call it, a fetus. You have a child with you and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now you'll see that it's referred to as being with child throughout the whole pregnancy. Right? So not only when you conceive, you're with child, but if you remember, when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, that would have been about the three-month mark, right? When she came back from staying with Elizabeth. So now the three-month mark after the first trimester, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now look here, when they travel into Bethlehem, right, with the taxing, and even says that she's great with child. So even before birth, it's still referring to that baby as a child, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Even in Revelation, right, up until birth. See, they want to kill this thing up until birth. The Bible's very clear that all throughout that pregnancy, of course, if at the beginning of a child, it's a, it's a child at the end as well. Revelation 12, and she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now I want to read you a couple of verses from the Bible as well that show that even before a child is born, that God, they have an identity, they have a soul, they have a, they have a, they're a person that lives inside that womb. Look at some of these verses. That's why the Bible is really clear. I don't know how somebody can be like, you'd have to be ignorant. Either, either you're ignorant or you're wicked to be a, a, a professing Christian and be pro-choice, to think that it's okay to take an innocent human being's life inside the womb. And the Bible's so clear that life does not start when you're born. Life starts at conception. You're already somebody that God knows, has plans for. Even I mean, he has plans for you even before you were conceived. But look at some of the verses we see here in the Bible. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, that did, did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast, so even before and after birth. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. So even since it was in the belly, he's saying, you were my God, even when I was in the belly. Now, isn't this interesting that the Bible says that God actually helps a baby come out of the womb? Thou art he that took me out of the womb. I just think that's an interesting to note that you know when you go through a physical pregnancy, you're not alone there by yourself. You know, you actually work, God is actually working at the same time to help you to deliver that baby. And it, it's a great picture because it's the same as soul winning, isn't it? If you think about it, with soul winning, we're travailing in birth, trying to get somebody saved, and God at the same time brings that person to salvation with us. And it's the same with physical birth. 
that even bringing a child into the world, it's the mother and God working together to bring that child and to create that birth, the physical birth as well as the spiritual birth. Psalm 139, verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Ecclesiastes 11, 5, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her, look at this, that is with child. So again, when you're in the womb, you are with child, not just with fetus. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. Isaiah 49, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother. Look at this, hath he made mention of my name. So even before you are even named by your parents god is already referring to you by the name you're going to have isn't that crazy jeremiah 20 this is sad look at this this is jeremiah lamenting right at the at the uh judgment and things that are coming on and he's kind of depressed like uh like uh, Eli uh, elijah was on the mountain because he slew me not from the womb or that my mother might have been my grave and her womb to be always great with me. How sad is that? That a place that ought to be a place of protection, a place of nurture, a place of, of nourishment, a place of safety becomes the dying place of a human being. It becomes a grave. How sad is that? He's saying that my mother might have been my grave rather than somewhere that gave life. Luke 1. I don't know if you ever thought about this passage in this way. This is when... Mary visits Elizabeth, right? And John the Baptist is six months in Elizabeth's uh, womb. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Hello, look at this. As soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Because somebody might say, well, maybe the babe just leaped because it was just reacting to the news, some emotional response from the mother and whatnot. No, the Bible actually says that John the Baptist, at six months old, in the womb of his mother, had joy, was happy to hear that the Lord Jesus Christ was conceived and was in the womb of his mother mary so it's very clear that john the baptist as a baby in his mother's womb had the joy it wasn't just cause for the joy of his mother now when is a baby conscious because some people might say well you know it might be alive but if they're not conscious then it's okay to kill them now think about this scenario, if somebody was in a coma, you know, they weren't aware of their existence, they weren't conscious, would it be right to pull the plug? You know, I guess if somebody's old, if that's what's keeping them alive, I mean, you know, the topic can get a bit more clouded when it comes to the issue of when does somebody have the right to end their own life? Or, you know, is it, is it, do they have a right to end their own life or can they refuse medical treatment? You know, I think, I think that is a, is a bit more of a difficult argument in terms of should somebody have the right to refuse treatment if that's the only thing that's keeping them alive and they're in great suffering. No, I'm not 100% on that one yet. But let's say, for example, let's take that same scenario because I am 100% on abortion <clears throat> in terms of being against abortion. Let's take that same scenario of somebody being in a coma. And let's say you knew that in just a matter of time, nine months, that this person would be perfectly healthy. They would come out of their coma, they would be, they would be conscious, they would know that they existed, they'd be able to feel, they'd be able to talk. I mean, would it be right to pull the plug then? Would it be right to pull the plug knowing that it's just a matter of time until that person is a, is a conscious human being? and knows that they exist and know they can feel pain and all that sort of stuff? Of course not. And that's what we have. You can just think of 
birth the same way, even if that baby isn't conscious that they are there. But it's just a matter of time until they are. So would it be right, would it be morally right to pull the plug on that? No, of course not. So this idea of no one knows when life begins really has no um, ground to stand on. Let's look at the second one. The second one is this, this is the one that you hear said all the time. My body, my choice. My body, my choice. And really, this is an argument of, of human rights to say, yeah, well, you, do, you have autonomy over your own body. You know, nobody can force, that's why you need informed consent to be operated on or to any uh, thing put into your body. Nobody can force you to medicate yourself or make you do anything that you don't want to do with your own body. Right? So this is where they're coming from. They're saying, my body, my choice. But they're forgetting the fact that the baby is another body. I mean, I don't see how somebody can argue the point that a baby is part of your own body. I mean, think about it. what part of your body grows up, detaches from you, right? Has a completely different DNA, different set of limbs, you know, possibly even a different gender. Grows up, detaches from you, argues back, and then goes on to get a job and get married and then have their own children. I mean, does the knee do that? Does the elbow do that? Does your heart, do, does any other body part do that? I mean, for somebody to say that the baby is a part of the mother's body, I mean, what, I don't know what universe they're born in where they can, they can reason that in their own mind. And we know that it's not the same body because it has a different DNA. It has a unique DNA that is not the same as the mother's. How can it be the same body? So of course, and that's why you, don't, you have a right to your own body, but you don't have a right to somebody else's body. And that's why she doesn't have the right to end the life of that body that is inside her own body. Now, why, why are people you know, so, so adamant about this? I'm trying to understand, like, where are they coming from to say, oh, the women's rights and women's rights, when, when it's like clearly the baby is, is another, another human being. And I think the way it's being argued from, I'm not 100% sure, because I was reading some articles, and one argument I think they're making is, well, it's, be it's because pregnancy and birth can risk the mother's life. Therefore, that's why, because you, have you ever heard the argument framed as, well, it's, 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 two, it's two rights that are competing with one another. See, I, I don't agree with that. But that's how they frame it. Why do they think it's two human rights competing with one another? Because one, the baby may have a right to life, but the baby living and, and being in the woman's body poses a significant risk to the mother, right? Because the mother's life could be at risk because birth and pregnancy have a risk. Now, yes, somebody who lives inside of another person's body is dependent on that other person. But just because you are dependent on somebody else, does that give you the right to end that person's life? No, no it doesn't. Because we can apply it to, you know, if, if you can end somebody's life just because they're dependent on you and there's some impact to your own life, does that mean that you are allowed to murder them? Of course not. Because think about it, even infants, once they're born, are dependent on their mothers. Disabled people are dependent on their carers. And what about when your parents get older? Older people, when they're dependent on people to take care of them, is it all right just to kill them because they become an inconvenience, because they impact your life? No. Just because something impacts your own life doesn't mean that you have the right to take the life of somebody else. Now, what's interesting about this, I was looking up, because I just thought, surely, you know, people arguing for human rights. I mean, surely a human, human right is, has, is a right to life. So I thought, you know, I'll look up what are the human rights that Australia has agreed to and see if it mentions anything about children, about babies. Now, Australia, you know, being part of the UN and all that sort of stuff, they've signed up to certain declarations of human rights. This not, doesn't really mean these are laws, but these are the things that they have kind of committed to, to say, hey, we are going to uphold these human rights, and this is where all people, when they mention human rights, this is what they're fighting from. And one of the things that they've signed up to, I thought was interesting, is, is the Australian Human Rights Commission Act in 1986, Schedule 3, which talks about the Declaration of Rights of the Child. Now, one phrase it says in here, look at this, it says, whereas the child, by reason of his physical and mental immaturity, 
needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protection, before as well as after birth. So what I don't understand is, how can they pass a law allowing abortion, murder up to birth, when, when the Commission of Human Rights is saying, well, no, they, they need protections before as well as after. So recognising that, that a child is a child even before birth. But I don't know how all these different human rights laws um, work because I think every state is allowed to adopt whatever human rights they want to. And this is why, you know, in some states, like in the ACT, the ACT is very specific that you do not get human rights until you are born, which, which doesn't make sense. But that means like a, a baby that's born preterm at 22 weeks has a right to life. But a, but a baby that has gone to full term and, is, and now is going to do a late term abortion doesn't have the right to life, even though they are older than the babies that have been born prematurely. But this is why, if you remember, I didn't, want to, I didn't show this video today, but if you remember that video, the magical birth canal, where it's for choice42.com, choice42.com made some videos, and it was actually, you know, sort of like dark humor that a baby only gets rights once they pass through the birth canal because that's basically what it's saying is only once you're born do you have the human rights to life and she was joking you know holding this big magical birth canal and the baby was just passing through and saying you don't have rights now you have rights you don't have rights now you have rights and it's like what is it just magic because you're just getting these human rights just because you pass through the magical birth canal no you get these human rights when you are conceived when you come into existence and that's when you have them so Human rights, they, they, they go under the banner of human rights, they just focus on the woman, they try and claim, well, you're part of the woman's body, no, you're not part of the woman's body, that baby has a different DNA, different organs, different limbs, different gender sometimes. That baby has human rights, even according to the Australian Human Rights Act, the Declaration of Rights of the Child. We don't have a right to deny them of that human right even if they are an inconvenience. Now, what about in the cases of rape? Because some people will say, well, well, what about in the cases of rape? Are you going to expect the woman to carry that baby to full term? Yes! You carry that baby to full term. You don't punish the child because of the sins of the father. And I'm not diminishing the fact that rape is a horrific thing. Rape is probably something that women will, you know, they will never forget what they went through. But there are plenty of testimonies out there of women who have been raped and when they abort their child, it doesn't help them. Why? Because now it's just two things on their mind that they've done. Because women are always, they're unsure when they go in for an abortion. Especially when it's rape, it's because they, they kind of probably innately know that they're punishing the child for something that they didn't even do. And they think, well, if I get rid of the child, it's going to get rid of the memory of my past mistakes or that past issue or that, that crime that was committed against me. But a lot of women are realizing that it doesn't. And all it did is add another thing on their head. Not only now were they raped, now they've got the guilt of taking the life of an innocent baby. You know, and oftentimes you hear stories as well of women who have been raped and the child that they, that they bear and they eventually carry to full term and had brought them lots of joy. It helped them actually overcome a lot of those uh, things that they had experienced in the past. So, no, you don't kill the baby in cases of rape. You know what you ought to do? You ought to kill the rapist. The rapist deserves the capital punishment. So you kill the rapist rather than kill the baby. Why should the rapist go on to live and be fed and housed in prison? No, if somebody has raped somebody, then you put them to death and you make it an example for other people that are going to do it. So we, don't even, we shouldn't even have this argument on whether a baby conceived in rape should be allowed to live. Number three, you've heard this one. This is probably one of the hardest even for me to argue before I understood all the issues surrounding it. They say, well, what about when you need to have an abortion to save a mother's life? To save a mother's life. And that's why the title of my sermon is Abortion is Murder. But you have to understand what is meant by abortion. And there is something called the Dublin Declaration, because out of all the European states, from what I hear, there is one country 
That is not legalized abortion, and that was Ireland. I don't know if it's changed now. Maybe they've already legalized it now. But what they did to try and uphold the pro-life position is they made it clear what is meant by abortion, because this is what is happening when you argue about abortion. They just think any medical procedure that results in the loss of a, the life of a child is an abortion. No. No, that's not what they define it as. So the Dublin Declaration said this. Dublin Declaration on maternal health care. And experience, as experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynecology, we affirm that direct abortion, what is that? The purposeful destruction of the unborn child is not medically necessary to save the life of a woman. That's why you hear medical practitioners, OBGYNs, gyne gynecologists, right, obstetricians saying, there's never been a case where I've had to perform an abortion to save a woman's life. What do they mean by that? That the procedure, the purpose of the procedure was to kill that child, to take the life of the child. Now, are there other procedures that may result in that child not surviving? Yes, but they don't classify that as an abortion. But why? Because that's not the purpose of the procedure. The purpose of the procedure was not to kill the child, even though it resulted in the loss of life. We uphold that there is a fundamental difference between abortion and necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of the mother, even if such treatment results in the loss of life of her unborn child. We confirm that the prohibition of abortion does not affect in any way the availability of optimal care to pregnant women. So this is called the Dublin Declaration, and it was signed by over a thousand medical practitioners, medical students, neonatologists, all sorts of people, and they're trying to get more signatures on there as well. I just think it's pretty cool that they are making that distinction, a very needed distinction between that, because that's what's always made it not join up in my own mind. I don't know if that helps you, is you kind of think, well, you know, it's like in the cases of a woman has cancer, you know, and she needs to get chemotherapy, and then the baby has to die because of it. Is that an abortion? No, because the, the purpose of that treatment was not to kill the child. The purpose of that treatment was to save the mother's life. But you have other issues as well, like an ectopic pregnancy. What's an ectopic pregnancy? An ectopic pregnancy is when, when the baby's conceived, but rather than planting in the womb, it plants in one of the fallopian tubes. Now, obviously, the baby can't live in the fallopian tubes, so it's, it's, it will die eventually. But not only that, the mother is going to die too if there's a rupture and a hemorrhage inside a body as that baby grows. So one thing they have to do is they have to remove that baby. Now, is that considered an abortion? No, it's not. Because the purpose of that procedure is not to kill the child. The purpose of that procedure was to save the mother. You can kind of think of it as a preterm delivery. But it's just so early that the baby can't survive, right? It's very small. And that's really the difference as well when it comes to you know, when, when you hear testimonies from practicing obstetricians and gynecologists where they say, you know, uh, you know a lot of, even a lot of the complications that happen in childbirth happen, you know, second trimester onwards. You know, ha happen late in the, in the pregnancy where the better alternative to an abortion is actually just delivering the child early, having a C-section. And, and a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know that an abortion can't just happen in an instant when the baby is so big, because the, the womb has to be prepared. Remember we watched that video? They've got to put the seaweed in there, they got to prepare. Sometimes the, the seaweed is in there and, and the woman goes home and comes back. You know, she's not on the table for two to three days while that seaweed is opening her cervix, right? So these procedures happen over a few days. They need to prepare and all this stuff that's going on. But a C-section, because they don't need to probably, I don't know, I don't even know why. I, like when I, when I watch a video like that and I'm just thinking, I don't, I don't know why they can't just like kill the baby like they do and then do a C-section. Like, does anybody know why? <laughs> like why, why can't they just do that, do a C-section, take the baby out? Why, why do they have to kill it and crush it and dismember it through the vagina? I don't know if there's some legal reasons that they're trying to get around, but I always thought that's how they did it. Because they try and do it with a late-term abortion. If you watch the late-term abortion one, they inject like a lethal dose of thing into the baby's head or the baby's brain, they hope it dies, and then the, the, the mother literally has to still birth that baby. Did you know that? Like even in a late term abortion, like the, the mother has to birth the stillborn, just like she has to birth the placenta. And I'm just thinking like, well if you're going through the birth anyway, why don't just let the child live? 
you know, and if, if the child can live outside the womb and it's more risky to do an abortion, why not just deliver the child and let the child live? I don't know whether people really know what it entails, but anyways, if you have these complications, it's safer, a lot of doctors say, to just deliver the child. You deliver the child, it can be done in under an hour, whereas an abortion takes two to four days to complete. And sometimes they don't even have two to four days. I mean, Dr. Levitino talks about an issue where a woman came in with high blood pressure and he couldn't wait two to three days to operate on her. So she, he has to, you know, deliver the child. You know, now do, do babies always survive when they're preterm delivery? No, but that's not an abortion. An abortion is when you purposefully kill that child as opposed to trying to deliver it, trying to save two lives. And if you understand that fundamental difference, that'll help you to argue this case, that there is a difference in the purpose of the procedure. If the purpose of the procedure is to try and save life, that's the right mindset. But an abortion, the purpose of the procedure is to take life. And that's what we're against. All right, let's go to the last one. last one is... Women will do it anyway. How many times have you heard people say that? Well, if you make, if you make abortions illegal, you know what, women are just going to get backroom abortions. What, I don't know what they call them, like uh, black market abortions. They'll do it themselves with just some, some liquid and a coat hanger or something like that. And, you know, when I hear people say that, I mean, then why outlaw anything? If that's your mindset, if your mindset is if you outlaw something, people are going to do it anyway, why outlaw murder? Why is that against the law? People are going to murder anyway. Yeah. And you know what's so ironic and contradictory from the left? When, and they always, you know, don't know which button to press when it's like, you know, the, the, there's two options that contradict each other. When it comes to guns, they don't, they don't have this mindset that if you make a law, people are just going to get them anyway. Why? Because they're always calling for more gun laws. More gun laws. People got guns. More gun laws. But when it comes to abortion, oh, if you outlaw that, then people are just going to do it anyway. No, no. If you outlaw it, that's when people think twice. And people think twice about things if it's against the law and there is a punishment to be paid for that crime. People think twice because if, it, if laws didn't do anything, why do we have them at all? Why have a law if people are just going to do break the law anyway? No, it's to deter people who may not break the law. It's to make them think twice. And the Bible actually teaches this. Because even when it talks about giving false witness, look at what it says. The judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto him, uh, his brother. Look at this. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. So you see how the law is there as a deterrent. If you don't have the law there, you're not deterring the sort of behavior. So to make the argument, even if you make it illegal, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, they might do it anyway, but a lot less of them are going to do it anyway. And that's the whole point. Now, I want to just end on this point is, you know, and I, I was kind of listening to one of the podcasts from Martin Isles. And, you know, that guy's very talented. I think, I don't know whether he's got the right gospel or whatnot, but I think he's, uh, he's a very articulate person and I think he's doing a lot of good uh, with the ACL organization. And one br thing he brought up that sort of made me think as well is, if the argument, if the argument for pro-life is so logically sound, why are people still so for abortion? I mean, if you can't defend it logically, you can't, you know, you, you have all these arguments that are inconsistent, contradictory. You know, it's like log logic is not why they are pro-abortion, why they are pro-choice. So I just thought I would mention some reason I think people are motivated in order to push the pro-choice position to push the pro-abortion position, even though it makes no sense at all. And one is, unfortunately, people might be ignorant. They may just not know what abortion entails. Like a lot of, a lot of women don't. That's one of the, 
the stories of Abby Johnson, you know, that Planned Parenthood director, and one reason why they're coming out with this movie because Planned Parenthood was teaching their employees a whole bunch of lies. Like, you know, children don't feel pain up until 28 weeks or whatever, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Lying to the women. And that made women go through with it. Because, because she said one of the things that the, the lady would ask when she was doubting whether or not to have an abortion was, will my child feel this? And when they were told no, that kind of comforted, comforted them to go through with it. But if they had known that the child would feel it, they wouldn't have done it. So some people are just ignorant. You know, they're ignorant of, oh, you know, I'm going to be campaigning for women's rights. I've got to stand for women's rights. When... This is not about women's rights. Women still have rights. This is about the rights of the child. Or they're ignorant about the procedure. Like we watched that video before. I mean, share that video around. I mean, that, that blew my mind, honestly, the first time I watched those abortion procedures. I mean, I've been seeing them, you know, regularly for the last couple of years. So, you know, that's just, that's why I can understand when somebody works in the abortion industry, how they can become desensitized to it. You know, if you work in a medical field, that's why I, I don't think not everybody in the abortion field is just some wicked person. Maybe, you know, they, at first, it kind of was like a bit uneasy for them, but when you work in it and you live with it, it just becomes, you're just desensitized to how horrific it is. And I think that's why it's not until somebody sees that person as a child, sees that somebody, sees that baby as their own child, man, that's when it really hits home. That's when it hit home for me anyway. Like, it really hit home and it really affects me, like in here, is, is after I became a parent. I remember being pro-life before, but uh, never spoke as loudly to me as it does now, uh, knowing that, you know, you know, knowing the joy of going through a pregnancy, knowing, you know, looking forward to meeting that child. And that's one thing I'm sure we've all experienced, and that's why miscarriages are so, are so sad. When I hear somebody have a miscarriage, I'm just like, man, that's, oh, that sucks. Especially, like, the later on it is in birth, you know, because you, you, you kind of build up that, that expectation, that hope, to be like, oh, I can't wait to meet this baby. And then when you lose them, ah, oh, what a sad thing. You know, I've heard stories of parents that have had miscarriages, and, you know, I had, I had a friend in the, the States that, you know, she told the story of, um, you know, she had a miscarriage, and in the bathroom, they were both there just holding their baby. And man, I just, oh, that's so sad. I just don't know how people go through that. Thank God I haven't had to go through that. I just, I don't know how I would cope going through it. I'm generally quite a strong person. I mean, Elizabeth knows me. I've never been one to be emotional in terms of like on some things. Like I always thought, you know, if somebody close to me passed away, I, 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 don't, I said, I don't even think I would cry. But for some reason, when it comes to my children, and I think about those things and, just, and I hear songs and I hear stories, it just brings me to tears. So, but they had the right mindset. Thank God they were believers telling that story. And, you know, they were trying to encourage other parents that had miscarriages and said, you know what? You know, we had this miscarriage, but, you know, we're going to see them in heaven. And they had multiple miscarriages, and they would just, you know, sometimes rejoice, like, hey, that's another child we're going to see in heaven. And, you know, that's having the right mindset. I know it's a difficult thing to have a miscarriage, but, you know, we ought not to sorrow as others that have no hope and, and look to eternity, realize, hey, you know, we did everything in our control not to cause that, and if, if God took that baby away, then there's a reason for it. And it might be... You know, God may have put you through that situation so that you can comfort others. Oftentimes, that's the reason why uh, you're allowed to go through suffering because if you go, some, something, go through something traumatic like that and you are able to have the mindset, now you can empathize with somebody. Man, I can tell you this. I can say, hey, you know, have the right mindset, have the right perspective. But you know what? If you are a woman that has gone through that and you have felt that, Man, your testimony to somebody who goes through that is going to be way more powerful than somebody that hasn't gone through that. Because I can only be sympathetic. I cannot be empathetic. So one is ignorance. Two is wickedness, right? Because somebody might just want to fornicate. There are people out there that are pro-choice because they, have, they don't care about the baby. They don't care about life. They just want to go out there and have unprotected sex and just think, hey, even if I just go out and fornicate, I can still just get rid of the problem. I can get rid of my responsibility. And that is absolutely wicked. And that's why, that's why God has laws about fornication. Yeah, it's not capital punishment, but he has laws if people fornicate, they should be forced to marry and all this sort of stuff. That's why you know, God hates 
fornication. He hates adultery. Why? Because of the problems it causes in society and the abortions that it causes, the bloodshed that it causes, because people don't want to face their guilt, face the shame of having a child out of wedlock. And that's another one. You know, where people don't want to face that shame and that guilt. So it could be that they just want to sin. It could just be that they have other important things that they want to do. Maybe they're just covetous. They think, oh, this baby's going to ruin my lifestyle. And they choose to kill the baby rather than uh, bring it to full term. So that's just number two, is just pure wickedness, right? People just doing things for the wrong reasons. But number three, and this is what really kind of was interesting to hear from Martin Isles, is some people just, they just need help. They need to confess the problem. And... I think that's true in a sense that because so many people have had an abortion, to vote against a bill for pro-choice is to admit that they have done wrong. Do you know what I mean? It's like people don't want to, people make excuses for divorce and whatnot because they've had one. And, And if they then go against it, they have to admit to themselves, hey, I did wrong. And they're not willing to do that. So whilst they, they're not willing to admit their own guilt, they're complicit and they encourage other people to do the same, to make themselves feel better about themselves. So some people just need help. They might be scared of the shame or the inability to take care of the, uh, their baby, but it also could be because they've had one and, or somebody they know has had one. Maybe like a, a parent has encouraged their child to have one or the, the husband of a woman has encouraged her to have one because they didn't want to take care of it. And because so many people now have done one, to outlaw it is to admit that they've committed murder. And people are not willing to do that. I just wish, I just hope that they would, that they would just confess it to God and move on, you know, and, and fight the good fight. Now, the last one I want to mention is is us, is you. Why are so many people still pro-choice when it's so obvious that killing a baby in the womb is, is murder? Because of us. Because we're too busy living our own life, building our own businesses, working our own job, too busy with life, too busy with the cares of this world that we don't speak up. We don't do anything. We don't sign the petition. Gosh, I hope some of you guys called your MPs. I hope you guys did something. I hope you guys at least wrote an email. They make it so easy these days. You just have to write a couple of sentences and click send and it sends out to all the MPs. ACL set it up. Did you even do that? Did you make a phone call? Man, but, you know, we're at fault as well because of what we don't do. Matthew 5. Ye are the salt of the earth. That's you. You are the salt of the earth. But look at this. But if the salt hath lost its savour, what's it saying? It's like if, you, if you've lost the, the passion, if you lost the, the fight in you, you've lost the purpose of why you exist, the truth that's in you, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out to be trodden under foot of men. See, we have a responsibility, guys, to be salt and light in this world. And if we are not the light in this world, who else is going to inject light in this world? The unbelievers? Are the unbelievers going to be the light in this world? No, it's our responsibility. So we have to take it on ourselves when things like this happen. We've got to step up. We've got to do something. We can't just complain. No, don't just complain about things that are happening in this world and say, oh, look how wicked the world is getting. When you didn't even fill out that email, you didn't even fill out that form, you didn't fill out that petition, you didn't even share anything on social media. When you post everything else on social media, can't you post something that's worthwhile? Post something that matters, of eternal value? Don't spend all your life doing things that are just vain, that are the cares of this world. Invest some of your life being salt and life in this world. Because honestly, guys, if, if Christians just stood up in this world, man, we'd make a huge difference, but they're too busy. 
They're too ignorant. And that's why when things like this happen, we don't even know what's going on. Let's not be like that. All right, let's, be, let's be people that make it. This is a way we can make a practical difference. You know, yes, we can pray, we can get together and hoo-ha about, hey, abortion is murder. But when there's actually a way to affect the laws and affect it in our country, let's try and make a difference. Even if we don't win the fight, let's say that we did as much as we could, or at least did something about it, rather than nothing. Proverbs 31. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So this Tuesday is the deadline for a submission for the Senate hearing. So hopefully you guys submit something. Um, hopefully the fight's not over, even if this law passes. But let's continue to pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for uh, the reminder from your word of our responsibility as believers in this world to be the salt and light. Help us not to lose our savour so that we're good for nothing. I pray that you help us to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. And I pray, Lord, that we would not forget why we're here. Yes, Lord, we've got to live our lives. We've got, to, we've got things to do. But Lord, help us to always prioritise the things that are important, especially when there are things that we can do at such a time like this. So I pray, Lord, help us to always have spiritual eyes so that we look at the world through the lens of eternity. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.